We are so glad that you chose to tune in today and to take part in this message. In fact, as we jump into this new year, 2019, we believe that seeking God is the best thing you can do this year. We pray that this message would encourage you and inspire you to live fully alive this year. Today is a, man, it's a, a very important day because it is day seven of our seven days of prayer and fasting. And uh, <clears throat> if you've been a, if, you, if you've been a part of that, uh, I will just say, way to go first. It's been a powerful week. We've had prayer meetings at 7 a.m. this past week, every uh, six days, so every day leading into today. And I think like 80 people or so each morning came together at 7, and we've been praying. And I've heard stories of, of physical healings this week. I've heard stories of people having estranged relationships restored in families. I've heard stories of people going, man, I am closer to God. Christians who have been following Jesus for years going, this week I have discovered God deeper and more intimately than ever before in my entire life. It has just truly been an amazing week. And so um, I'm excited. I'm excited about what God uh, is doing as this year we begin to pray and learn to pray like never before and just really starting off that way. But it's also important uh, that we recognize today that it is day seven of our fast. And I need to let you know something that I'm very religious about. Uh, I'm, I'm very, I'm very upfront. I do not believe Christianity is about religion. It's about relationship. Jesus came to the earth. He died on a cross. He rose that we would have relationship with him, not that we would follow a religion because religion is about man-made rules. God is about a relationship where his supernatural power works through us. There is one thing I'm religious about though, and it is that the fast ends at sundown. <laughs> so at 510 today, I will be eating and I just like everybody who asks questions about that. And if you're like, well, you know, technically, whatever. You can do whatever you want. The fast is between you and God. But at 510 today, uh, and of course, somebody said to me, well, the sun's not even out today. So I'm, again, that's between you and God. 100% uh, up to you. It's your fast. Uh, but it has, been, it has been good and cool to see our church rally. So many, I know for the first time. Uh, my, my wife, she really, uh, really struggled because it's my five-year-old's, well, my four-year-old, it's, it's my son Soren's fifth birthday today. And um, Megan last night went to get him some Chick-fil-A so that he could have Chick-fil-A on his birthday. And so she had to drive home on a liquid-only fast and smell Chick-fil-A nuggets. And then she said she got stuck behind a train to just sit and soak in that aroma. But you know what? Our family will have Chick-fil-A today, and the rest of you just have to suffer because it's closed in Jesus' name. And so <laughs> that's not encouraging at all, and I'm really sorry. But I just said that. Uh, we, are, we are continuing a series we started last weekend called Finished with Fake. And every year at the beginning of the year, we, we come into a new series, a new time where I really try to, to gear us into, in a direction that through prayer, God, where do you want us to really kind of set our vision, set our sights in 2019 for a new year? And, and overwhelming, I shared last week over the last several months, just this whole concept this year to believe for me, to believe for you, for our church, and, and wherever God would allow us to reach, to really be finished with fake, to be finished living a pretend life, to be finished seeking after things that, that, that promise something to fulfill us, but at the end of the day, always leave us wanting more. To discover this real, authentic life of living for Jesus and experiencing the life he has for us, from our kids to our students to however old we are to really experience this life. And this is what we're going after. And it's a series, just like last week, the same today, it's a series where I'm saying, guys, we've gotta be intentional to ask ourselves questions about who we are and why we do what we do, and if we will, I do believe that God will show up in a powerful way this year to really change us and make us who he called us to be. So would you pray with me as we ask him to speak today to us? Lord, um, I thank you right now for the power of your Holy Spirit that is inside of every one of us who's your follower. And I pray right now that ultimately, God, you would be our guide and you would be our teacher over these next minutes. I pray you would remove distractions in our minds. I pray, God, for some of us who, who came in today and we came in just to, just, we, we, just to sort of check the box, Lord. We came in just to say, I'm gonna go to church and we're already thinking about what's next. Lord, would you help us zero in right now? Not miss what you have for us right now, God. Would you make us into the men and women you called us to be? In Jesus' name, amen. 
Last weekend, I started with this passage of scripture. I wanna read this verse again, Mark chapter 8, verse 35. It says this, if you let your life go for my sake, this is Jesus talking, if you let your life go for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, you will continually experience true life. But if you choose to keep your life for yourself, you will forfeit what you try to keep. Jesus just comes right out. He's very blunt. He's very honest. He's like, listen, every morning you're going to get up. You have to choose. Am I going to live my life today for Jesus or for myself? If I live for myself, I will miss out on life. If I live for Jesus, I will discover real life. And it's an opportunity for a continual daily experience where I come alive more every single day in the midst of anything that may go on. I really experience who he is The question for me, the question for you is, do I, will I wake up every morning and decide? I'm finished with the other stuff. God, it's gotta be you today, not me. It's gotta be you today, not me. Today, in order to help us go after this, I wanna wanna talk to you about a couple things that I think they will trip us up if we're gonna live our life this way so that we can discover how uh, how to avoid them. We're gonna go to this passage of scripture and and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's several chapters, in fact, several verses, not several chapters. It is the last service. I suppose we could stay here that long. But um, oh, several verses uh, in, in the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 32, Exodus is the second book of the Old Testament, if you're new to Bible. And we find in Exodus this time where there's been a guy named Moses. Moses was a leader of God's people. He had led them out, out, of, out of just terrible conditions. He had been used by God to, to lead people into, uh, into something of a much better life, to be freed from slavery, be freed from so many things. And then Moses finds himself in this place where he's, he's God's asking him to, to come to spend some time with them. And so Moses essentially lets everybody know, I'll, I'll be back if you will. I gotta go spend some time with, with God. Here we pick up Exodus 32, verse one. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Aaron was sort of like Moses' helper, walked alongside of him, was also the important leader. And he said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Through this passage and through these scriptures today, I hope to pull out some encouraging things, some convicting things, and I wanna show you even some things that I find are humorous. Right here in verse one, we find this group of people who had a leader who had been used by God to help him, and in the moment, he isn't right there for them to meet their needs. They say this, hey, this, this guy, this, this, this fellow Moses, y'all yeah, don't really even know Moses who? I don't even know who that is. Hey, Aaron, would you actually help us? Because the truth is in our innate nature, if we're not careful, if we, leave, if we live to, uh, to just please the crowd, the moment the crowd isn't having their needs met, they'll leave you. The moment that itch isn't getting scratched, we'll just go, hey, Aaron. So this is what Aaron did, verse two. Take off your gold earrings that your wives and your sons and your daughters, of your wives and your sons and your daughters. So they took off all their earrings and they brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Wait, wait, wait. Like they were there. They walked through the impossible scenario and situation. They supernaturally saw God, not in person, but his intangible work happen where they shouldn't have been able to make it. They, had make, they made it, and then all of a sudden, they've decided. <laughs> this is your God. It's a cow. (laughs) The title of my message today, if you want to write it down, I think you should, is cow tipping. (laughs) I want to talk to you today about cow tipping. And before I get to that, I want to tell you today that I think if we're not careful, we make cows in our life. If we're not careful, we create things in our own ability, we create things with our own hands, we create things with our own resources and decide these are the things I will trust in because I got impatient waiting for God. 
Something didn't happen in the time I wanted it to happen, so all of a sudden I've decided I'll go ahead and create on my own. We make decisions all day long. But I would offer to you today, decisions made from impatience are usually made in ignorance. Decisions made from impatience are usually made in ignorance. Well, I want, I want this to happen. I want this to change. I want this to get better. And it didn't happen in the time I wanted it to happen, so I just take matters into my own hands. And the problem or struggle I have, and maybe you're here today and you're like me, is I want what I want, I want it now. Are there any impatient people willing to be honest in church today so God could help us, right? That, that, is, my, that, is, that is my struggle. It's the start of a new year. We're, we're still in the time frame when it's a little bit easier to be patient for our whole year. We're still in the time frame where maybe, maybe you're like, hey, 2019, you know, it's gonna be the year I get in shape. And so we're only two weeks in. And so maybe it's two weeks in, you've gone to the gym a couple times. In fact, maybe you did the liquid fast and, and you're like, oh my gosh, skinny. <laughs> maybe you started eating healthy, whatever it may be. Maybe you decided I'm gonna get serious about my faith and I'm gonna come to church every weekend and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take steps to serve and to get involved and we're two weekends in and you're here. These are both very good things. The issue comes when the end of January hits and we look at ourselves in the mirror and we go, I don't have a six pack yet. The issue comes when the end of January hits and we've came to church three or four weeks in a row and we're like, everything's not better in my life. I don't know everything there is to know about God. I thought this getting close to God would solve all my problems, but apparently it doesn't. it takes it takes patience to consistently do small things over time to actually walk into what God has for us the israelites created a cow i don't think anybody here's like i'm going to go home and create a cow i mean you might but that's beside the point The question is, if because we've been waiting for God to establish who we are or something in and through us, have we just tried to make something else? We need to understand this truth. I need to be reminded of this truth. It's this, we underestimate what can be done in a year and we overestimate what can be done in a day. We underestimate what can be done in a year and we overestimate what can be done in a day. It's the reason, if you work at a gym, it's the reason you crack up in January like a fitness center, because somebody comes in, you know, they didn't work out in 2018, New Year's resolution, I'm gonna get in shape in 2019. They come in, hey, today, January 10th, I'm gonna get in shape today, they worked out six hours. January 11th, they were so sore they couldn't walk, they said it doesn't work. But yet the small habit done consistently over the course of the year would have got them where they wanted to get in December. What do your habits look like? What are your habits today? Because I believe the reason that the Israelites made a, a calf, the reason they were like, Aaron, give us something to worship because we were counting on this dude to take care of us and, and he left for a moment is because they had not developed their own relationship. They had not developed their own sense of maturity. They had not developed their own spirituality so that in the moment things didn't go the way they wanted them to go, they would be okay. Instead, when things didn't go the way they had hoped or had planned for them in their own mind, they made a terrible decision. Listen, what you and I do when things don't go the way we want them to go are a result of the habits we have in place when things are going the way we want them to go. Because it's true for me and I know it's true for you. There's just gonna be some times this year when I'm like, that's not what I wanted to happen. But I'll be able to say, but you'll be able to say, but that's okay, because I've been prepared for this moment. Because I've been doing the small things. 
What do your habits look like? I would ask this question today. Do your habits match your hopes? Because my habits should support what I say my hopes are. Say, so I, I, hope, I hope to grow closer to Jesus in 2019. Do our habits support that? I hope to make my marriage stronger in 2019. Do our habits support that? I hope to make my relationship with my kids better in 2019. Do my habits support that? I hope to be trusted by my parents more in 2019. Do my habits support that? What, what, are, what are my habits? I mean like small things, like small habit. I, I have this one small habit. The first app I open on my phone every single, di- every single day is the Bible app. It's a super small habit, but it's a way I make sure I don't ever look at something or put something else that would be a distraction for my day before I put God's word in my mind. Super simple habit. But what it does is it makes sure every day, whatever comes at me, I've already put a filter in my mind of the promise of God. People tell stories, I mean, people have written books about the habits of flossing and folding your bed. These super small things that simply get you on the right path so that when all hell breaks loose, you don't make a calf. Because let's be real, this made God mad. If you're wondering what makes God mad, it's when we put something in the place of him. And this is what, this is the very essence of what fake is. When we, when we trust in something that is not real to deliver an immediate result of what is intended to, to potentially take time but will actually give us fulfillment. If you've been fasting, let me give you a great example. Comfort food. I haven't had comfort food in seven days. I just need comfort food. And God's like, because I'm supposed to actually give you what you look to in that food. And when you look to something else, here's how, here's how Maddie was. And over the next two verses, if you, if you don't chuckle with me, um, that's okay. But I just think you should because we discover really what I believe, how God puts humor when he teaches us. Exodus 32, verse 7. God's talking to Moses. He sees what's going on. It says, the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. <laughs> Moses, your people, they got bad. Go down there and do something about it. God's the one that showed up supernaturally. So verse 11, here's what happens. Moses sought the favor of the Lord. He said, Lord, Why should your anger burn against your people who you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Oh, they're your people, God. No, they're your people, Moses. I don't want to deal with their impatience. So Moses, he has to leave presence of the Lord because he's got to deal with this. God's got to say, Moses, go deal with this because God didn't get face to face with his people. He had that special relationship. This is before Jesus. He had that special relationship with Moses for Moses to lead his people. So he's got to go deal with it. So he heads out. He heads down. Verse 19 of Exodus 32, Moses approached the camp and he saw the calf and the dancing and his anger burned And he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf the people had made and he burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and he made the Israelites drink it. Then he said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them into such a great sin? Don't be angry, my Lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. It's not, my, it's not my fault, God. You, you know these people. Like I'm trying, Lord, I'm trying to do the right thing, but, but you know these people. Do you know one of the number one things that causes us to live a fake life is the cow or the false idol or whatever you wanna call it of people pleasing. Aaron saw the miracle working hand of God and all of a sudden the crowd goes, Aaron, make us happy. 
And Aaron goes, okay, give me your earrings. I will tell you as a pastor, th this is just so real, if I could just for a moment, when it comes to the local church and the church in America. Because there's always a temptation as a pastor that you could just say what the people want to hear. Scratch that itch, make them happy. And I believe the worst thing I can do as a pastor, the worst thing any pastor can do, is simply just say what the people want to hear. What we are called to do as spiritual leaders is to say the truth of God and the hope that's in it. Which means sometimes the people, and this is like us, the people, we won't like it. Just like my two-year-old Griffin when he asked for mac and cheese for the 17th time in a week. We say no because we're not living to please him. Because guess what? There comes a point in time when you're two years old that you need more than boxed craft macaroni and cheese. There comes a time for followers of Jesus Christ when we need more than to simply get some practical advice. And we need to know I have to be responsible to feed myself as a follower of Jesus. I have to be able to be close enough to God so that when things are difficult, I don't just have to wait for someone to tell me, but that I've got a relationship of myself with Jesus so that I'm able to stay pure and stay true to him when things aren't going great. Lord, you know how prone these people are to evil. If it's not the idol of people pleasing, it's the beautiful idol of excuses. Well, God, God, I would have, I, I, I would have, I would have, but God, I would have, but you know, you know how they are, Lord. You know how they are. In Proverbs chapter 29, the scriptures talk about the importance of having clear um, future. The, the word it would use in the scripture is prophetic vision, meaning clear understanding of, of what God's plan is, of what his desire is. It's through his word always and like what he's speaking in a moment. And he says, if, if, the people, if the people don't have clear vision and clear understanding, what happens is they just begin to, to act a fool. Verse 25, Moses saw that the people were running wild and that Aaron had let them get out of control and so become a laughing stock to their enemies. I would, I would say that we could all read this passage today from Exodus 32, verse 1, to right there in verse 25. And say, Lord, don't let that be what the American church looks like. Where we've just created our own simple self-help models and our own little things instead of living with a full purpose and abandonment to God's ways, to his plan. Because what happened in verse 25 is what I want to make sure God's church, meaning not, not simply community church as a local church, but his church doesn't happen. It says they became a laughing stock to their enemies. I believe so often the reality is the church it, where it has lost influence, it's lost influence because we tried to change the world in the world's ways. Instead of to believe that we have a supernatural God who has supernatural power in and through his followers. And it's when we seek that and that purpose that we actually see culture and worlds change. 
And so our hope for this year, even as we talk about becoming more and more of a prayer culture, I, I, I want us to grow as a, as, as a local church expression, big people like never before, whole people, that we would understand who God is, that we would be able to feed ourselves like never before this year, that we would be able to rise up and be the people of greater influence in the 757 and beyond, perhaps like never before as a church because we're understanding this is what it's about because there's no greater purpose in our life than to simply this, love God and as a result of loving him, there'll be this natural outflow to love people. So what'll happen? We've gotta fight against the temptation to build cows. So much so, in fact, the Apostle Paul, he was the leader of the early church after Jesus died and rose from the grave. He, he seated, the Bible says he is seated in heaven praying for you and I right now. That is what our Savior Jesus is doing. And he put this guy named Paul in place to be the first leader of the multiple local churches. Paul would travel to different regions and he would start local churches and he would write letters to them. And he wrote this, church, he wrote this letter to this church in Galatia. The book of the Bible is called Galatians. And he wrote this letter and in Galatians chapter four he says this. So you are no longer a slave but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. In Exodus, they built an idol, they built a calf because they didn't understand who they were. Sometimes in order for us to make sure and know who we are, God has to remind us who we're not. You're not a slave. You're not a slave to your past. You're not a slave to addiction that might even still be a struggle today. You're not a slave to any of it. God says, I came to set you free. And the Bible is very clear. Who Jesus sets free is free indeed. This is the promise of what it means to follow Jesus. He says, you're a son or a daughter. So we could all just go, woo, high five it up. And then verse eight, formerly you didn't know God and you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God or rather are known by God. See, it's not so much what we know, it's that God knows us. He says this then, how is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Because in impatience, even today in 2019, when I'm like, God, I want this to be better, I want this to already be solved, I don't wanna still struggle with this. Out of my ignorance, in my impatience, I end up making something fake. I end up focusing, I believe, on an image instead of my identity. I think this is perhaps the hardest thing any of us will struggle with. It's the difference between image and identity. Image is self-created, identity is given to us by God. Most of us if we're not careful, we use a ton of our efforts to create an image of ourselves. And in 2019, social media has only like, man, magnified that like we can't imagine over the last 10 years. Where we're like, I just need to make an image. An image that I like and an image that other people like. And the thing is, God's not trying to give you and I an image. He's trying to give us an identity so that we don't have to focus on an image. And here's the difference. Image can be seen. Identity is known. Image can be seen, but identity is known. When I know who I am because of what God says, I don't have to try to build something so that other people would approve of me. 
when I know who I am because of what God has said. I don't have to allow, allow those words that people speak to me that are lies about who I am or what I'm like to have any power over my life because I'm not trying to create an image or have an image created of me. I'm simply trying to say, God, I believe I'm your son. I believe I'm your daughter, whatever the case may be. And I'm gonna live from that. And then, then I can stay patient to make sure I don't create a cow. In fact, can I just get my cow back real quick? Thank you. No actual cows were injured, by the way, in the making of this message. Almost even with this backdrop, hear these words of Psalm 135. The idols of the nation are silver and gold, made by human hands. Please go to the next slide for the sake of my reading of Psalm 135. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. Ears but cannot hear, nor is there breath in their mouths. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. Do we trust in a, an earthly relationship? Do we trust in a job? Do we trust in an image based on the number of likes or followers we've created on social media? Do we trust in a home? Do we trust in a position or a title? Even, even do we trust in, do we trust in being able to like just make our voice known? More than trusting God? Because whatever that idol is, he would say today, it's time to go cow tipping. See, this is how you take a deeply spiritual moment. And you go, I feel like it should be more spiritual, but I wanna laugh. And that's where, just honestly, that's what I think we often miss about God, is his humor. Moses, your people, God, your people. He's like, I know this life is gonna be difficult sometime. It's why I put in the book of Proverbs, laughter's great medicine. Like live a life of humor while you're going and tipping some cows. Now listen, I did some research on cow tipping. Because before I preach, I study the scriptures, I study the theologians, I, I study that. I also try to study if I'm bringing in an element so that, I, so that I know what I'm talking about at least to some degree. How many of you have ever been cow tipping? Yes, Jesus' name to those of us who grew up in small towns. Um, how many of you at least know what cow tipping is? Okay, so, so I did a little bit of research because I, I, I was in the belief system until, until this past week that it was true that the problem with cow tipping was is like you go push the cow over like it'll hurt them and they won't be able to stand back up, but that's not true. Like you can go cow tipping and you're really just gonna annoy the cow or the farmer and probably hurt yourself and get yourself muddy and get some cow duty all over you. Because what happens when you tip the cow is, um, is he, he can stand back up. And this is why what I want you to understand today is this a daily choice when I wake up in the morning to go today, I'm gonna tip the cow. That false thing that I'm trusting in, I have to tip it today. Because tomorrow morning, the enemy's gonna try to stand him back up in front of me. And he's going, today, you have the power to tip me again. We're on the earth, we're not in heaven. Therefore, the cow can still come. The false thing that would say, trust in this, I have the answer to your future, it can still present itself in front of us, but it does not have power and it does not have the final say. The followers of Jesus, full of Holy Spirit, do. Question is, 
will we be finished with that which we've created, either in our minds or literally made, to be the answer to our future and put a new or fresh trust in Jesus. Would you close your eyes with me today? If you're here today and you know I'm talking to you right now, you know there's things you're trusting in. And they're not God. But they haven't really failed you. And you're kind of afraid of what would happen if I didn't have them. Lord, I pray for those that that's where we are right now. They may not even be bad things, but inside we know we, we, haven't, we haven't been able to let go of our trust in that thing. And the problem is it's keeping us from a full experience of you. And I pray right now in Jesus' name that you would do a work inside of us, Lord, to, to revolutionize the way we trust, the way our faith is, the way we believe. I pray right now in Jesus' name, Lord, for those that maybe are sitting here right now and, and they're going, God, what is, what is that thing? What is that false thing that I'm trusting in? Lord, would you reveal that? Would you reveal that to your sons and daughters that we could get rid of it, that we could tip it, that we could make it a part of our practice where no longer will we count on that which is fake or pretend to be something we're not, but God, there's a new, there's, a, there's an understanding of what it means to be raw, to be real, to be the authentic us because that's where continual real life is with you. Today, if you'd be honest with yourself and you'd say, you know, I think that I, think that I have trusted in some things when I should have been trusting in Jesus. And today I wanna, there, there's tangible things after today I leave, I know I need to, to, to make some shifts in, but I wanna, I wanna solidify what's going on in my heart right now and just declare, I am no longer gonna trust in that fake thing. I'm gonna put all of my trust in him. If that's you today, would you just lift your hand up in the air? Say, that's me right now, Pastor, that's, that's me, awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm so proud of those of you lifting your hands just a couple more moments because I don't want you to miss a moment when your heart's beating fast and you know God's, you know it's God because you're like, I know, I know this has been me and he's speaking to me. Don't, don't worry, nobody's, nobody's gonna bother you. This is, this is you doing a bold movement to solidify what God's doing in your heart. Awesome, yes. You could put your hands down. If you, if you raised your hand, would you pray this prayer with me? And, and would you pray it incredib incredibly bold? Like you're, you know, like you're going out to the farm and you're like, I gotta be strong right now to get this thing over. <laughs> Say, Jesus, I love you. And I believe you have me. You love me. So today, my trust is in you. Help me trust in nothing else from now on, every day. I'll tip the cow so I can seek you and experience you in every area. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Could we give God praise one more time?